Hi, my name is Laura Manhill, and I'm the Stewardship and Education Director from Friends of the Mississippi River, and I'm excited to be with you all today um, to talk a little bit about the process that our organization has gone through um, in the past few years in developing a land acknowledgement, um, and then moving beyond land acknowledgements, uh, which is the title of my presentation, um, knowing that words are really important and powerful, but so are our actions. And so that's, I'm going to take you through our process today uh, and then talk a little bit about uh, where you all are in your journey and um, different ways um, that we can be in solidarity with indigenous communities of Minnesota Makoche, which is Minnesota. So I'm going to start with um, a little bit about who we are. Friends of the Mississippi River, uh, we're a nonprofit. We've been around since 1993, and we engage people to protect, to restore, and enhance the Mississippi River and its watershed in the Twin Cities region, and our work takes place on Dakota homeland. Is anyone familiar with uh, Friends of the Mississippi River? Yeah. And we work at 35 sites along um, the river, also known as Haha ha Wakpa, that's the Dakota name. So just as a quick little warm-up, I'd like you to take about 30 seconds to think about a special place in the outdoors, in nature, it could be found where you live or where you work, and think about what makes that important to you. Um, and then if we, if maybe we can do a quick couple people share out. Um, you could share your name, you can name the place. It could be a park, it could be a rock, it could be a tree, it could be a general area, a body of water. So think about what is that special place to you. Um, recently I heard someone talk about nature is not apart from us, but it's a part of us. Um, and so it's kind of a, another way of thinking about all these special places um, on the land that we reside. So maybe think about that for a second and a few people if they want to share out their place. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, trees are really powerful. I was just in a, a training recently where we were learning about how trees as technology, because we think of technology as, you know, the internet and the computer and all these amazing things, but trees can do so many things. And um, a lot of people believe, you know, trees, they have, they hold on to our memories. And I actually do talk about that in the presentation. And they've been here, you know, long before all of us, and we'll, a lot of them will be here long after us. So uh, it's, it's very powerful when you think about that. And can, nature can be very grounding and humbling <laughs> and thinking about who we are. Anybody else want to share? You can also just kind of hold on to that, that special place um, in your head. And also, I think, as you mentioned, important to think about, um, you know, we're here now. 
in these spaces. And Dakota people have been here for thousands of years. Um, Ojibwe Nation has been here hundreds of years. Um, and so we're, uh, many of us, um, I can't speak for everyone, but many of us have only been here for a really short time when we think of the, the long time that people have been present on this, this land. Um, thinking about, when we're thinking about land acknowledgement, I think it is really important to start with your relationship with the land. And I, it was really lovely to hear some of your reflections and connections um, to land. Uh, this is from Mary Lyon from the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. She says, when we talk about land, land is part of who we are. It is a mixture of our blood, our past, our current, and our future. We carry our ancestors in us and their around us. Uh, yeah, do you want to fix to switch this? Yeah, Let's, is it giving a little bit of feedback here? No problem. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so when we think about nature, in a lot of cultures, um, especially indigenous cultures, nature is really seen as part of uh, people. Even I heard a Dakota elder say that you are a Think of even yourself as a land mass, right, as a person, um, which I thought was a really interesting way of, <laughs> of thinking about um, acknowledgement. Um, and obviously it looks different for everybody, um, but it is really important when you start this journey to think about your own relationship, your own identity, your own connections to land, um, and things that we've forgotten. And, you know, uh, in our modern world, sometimes we get disconnected, I think especially when we live in more urban areas. Um, I had a conversation with some Dakota women recently that said it's really easy to not see how degraded our land actually is and when you live in an urban setting because you're just you know, driving on streets and moving around and not necessarily seeing the impacts of pollution and you know, what's, what's happened because of um, settler colonialism to this, this land that we live on. Um, so I like thinking about the land itself, um, that it's, it's our past, our current, and our future, right? So what we do today matters. What, people, what our ancestors did on this land, it matters, it all matters, no matter who we are or where we came from. So I really like this quote. Uh, I have a video um, that's a great example of uh, kind of just an encompassing idea around land acknowledgement, and I am going to play that for us. It's going to work perfectly. I just know it <laughs> because she and I practice. I can just find, oh, there it is. Find my little mouth. All right. See? I told you it was going to work. And this is just going to overview.
heard or took away from just that what you heard people saying and mm -hmm. yeah other countries have it's a policy even right I thought that was really interesting that we acknowledge the land that we're on there's countries that have already started to do land return and sometimes people get really scared when you start talking about land return and they think like you're going to make me move off the land that's not necessarily what that means or what that looks like so you know there's public spaces and there's things that are are happening it's pretty exciting yeah mm -hmm. Right. We talk about that at Friends of the Mississippi River because it's the same way that we work. Is obviously the river is really big, <laughs> so it can feel really overwhelming. How can we possibly just help protect and restore the river? But when everybody starts these, all these little, just like Lake Itasca, you know, it's small. But then by the end, by the time you get to the Gulf, it's, it's huge. So <laughs> those little movements do pick up. Anything else that is bringing up for folks? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what I hear a lot of times, so my background, I'm multiracial, multicultural. African American. Obviously, I don't know all the details of that um, because a lot of my people were stolen from from their indigenous lands and, and brought here. Um, and then my, on my mother's side, um, where I have European descent, um, and there's also some native. Uh, I do have some native descendants, but don't have a, a specific connection or know which exactly which nation um, kind of got lost. Uh, so. For me, a lot of times I think about, you know, what is my place? So thinking even about like your own identity 
on this land, but I still definitely see myself as a guest on this land, but in a complex way. <laughs> so, and, and even uh, talking with um, other uh, indigenous folks about when you go to, you don't necessarily have to, uh, when you go to other people's places, and they, they spoke about this in here, if you go to another place, you want to pay your respect. Um, so just because you're indigenous to uh, this land, that doesn't mean you don't pay your respects to the other nations and sovereign nations that are on in different as you move around different places. Um, so I thought that was also interesting and important to note. Yeah. Let me go back to what you told me, right? Okay. Um, so I kind of just to ask you a little bit more before I talk more about our process. Um, what do you feel like your purpose as a community is in creating this land acknowledgement? And what are some of the things you're hoping to get out of our time today, knowing that this is kind of just a first step in that domino, right? <laughs> what are some things that has brought this about? And there's not a right or wrong answer, so. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Anybody else thoughts around why this might be important or even questions that you're just having right now? <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. What's next? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And that's what, if you go online, one of the resources that I talked about is the Native Governance Center. They have a whole session about beyond land acknowledgments. And one of the things they talk about is to assess for your community, you know, um, why are you doing this? And then think about, for as much time as you labor over the right words to say, you could be doing, right? There's things we can be doing and actions that we can be taking. So we do want to, it's not that you don't want to spend time to think about what you're saying and being intentional, but also to spend as much time to think about what are our ongoing, what's our ongoing commitment to indigenous solidarity, um, which is why for, to be totally transparent about our process, uh, before I came, I've been at FMR for about a year, and before I came, um, they had started this committee, and we actually changed the name of the committee from the, uh, the Land Acknowledgement Committee to the Indigenous Solidarity Committee, because recognizing even what we're calling ourselves, that's not really sufficient, right? Just making a land acknowledgement. And, and the group was doing more than that, but I think even just renaming ourselves and knowing that this is an ongoing commitment that our organization has to what can we do, what are our um, So what is a land acknowledgement? Uh, there's a lot of different definitions, but overall it's a formal statement that pays tribute and honors the original inhabitants of the land we're on. It shows respect for indigenous people and recognizing their enduring relationship to land and place. And we've just been saying <laughs> uh, that words are not enough. We want to really consider our actions. This is what I was just mentioning. If you're contemplating writing a statement, we encourage you to commit the bulk of your writing time to outlining the concrete ways you plan to support indigenous communities into the future. And I just come back to that a lot um, when we're thinking about all of our actions. Um, I'm just trying to center that. Questions about this? Or? 
Um, so as we've been talking about, so I wanted to, the next part of the presentation, I'm kind of go through a little bit of our land acknowledgement and then some of the processes that we've gone through. Um, acknowledgement is obviously the first step and really wanting to be honest, right, and telling the truth. Uh, I did the Badote field trip to the Minnesota Humanities Center and uh, an educator named Ramona Stately, and she talks about, you know, this is important that we tell everyone the truth, people of all ages, right? Sometimes we feel like we have to censor things a lot for children, but she said, you know, when is it appropriate to, to lie to children then, you know? Um, and unfortunately, a lot of us were lied to in our upbringing in terms of our education about Dakota people, about this land, about, you know, what really happened here. Um, and so I think it is really important that we are telling the truth. And it, as the woman mentioned in the video, that really does open things up, right? If we're being honest about um, how we all got here and, and you know, what the current status of things. Um, so uh, Wakpa Sanka or Haha Wakpa is the Dakota name for the river that connects all waters and all lives where we live. We live on, among the traditional homelands of the Dakota people who know this place at their origin at Badote, the confluence of the rivers, the burial grounds of their ancestors, or Makapa at Indian Mounds Park, which is actually now, since I've written this, it's now been designated as a cemetery, which is what it is, um, and elsewhere, the homes of hundreds of generations who stewarded this place for thousands of years. While these have long been Dakota homelands, Minnesota has also been home to and nurtured by many other indigenous nations, including the Ojibwe and the Ho-Chunk. So also important to note that. Uh, Badote, this is a picture of Badote. We work at sites, as I said, along the Mississippi River. Um, this is, you know, a site that we often work at. Um, a Badote is Dakota for where two waters meet. It's looking westward on Haha, Minnesota. And the river, as many names, the Mississippi River, actually, if you look it up, there's so many different names um, from different nations. But Haha, Wakpa is Dakota, Mississippi, um, Mississippi River, Mississippi is uh, Ojibwe. We steward in Minnesota has long been stewarded by many uh, Native nations. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the place where we all live. This is another picture of uh, Bedote. And Bedote is also a site of creation um, for Dakota people. So it's a very sacred space. Uh, and if you're familiar with it, it's right near Fort Snelling, um, which many Dakota people refer to as a concentration camp um, because there's, I just was at a, a talk, and I'm going to share the link to the video uh, Dr. Montanupa, and he spoke about his, he has had a grandmother um, who was held there at the concentration camp and, and then eventually killed um, and thrown into the river. And he says, you know, I have to live with that generational trauma. And so for me, it's not a, it's not a historic site. It's not, you know, this is, it's a, it has a lot of different meanings and connotations. I know that that site themselves are working on reimagining the way that they tell that narrative. Um, so it's it's just very important, like as we said, to not just rename things, but also to, to tell the truth about what these places are. This is uh, the Mounds Park Cemetery. Um, this is in St. Paul. This is another site that Friends of the Mississippi River, River has worked at for many years. and Something that we've been working on with there's a another there's a native led organization called the Lower Phelan Creek Project and they're working on daylighting the Phelan Creek which uh, used to connect uh, the Phelan Lake and a lot of the other streams and lakes in St Paul um, which is where our offices are located by and something that we've had to really consider is the language that we're using about this site um, the fact that this is a summit. It should be treated as such. We recently interviewed a local woman who is Dakota, and she lives right by the mounds, and she told us a story. Um, her name's Crystal Norcross, and she told us a story of how when she was 12 and when she realized that this is a cemetery. Um, and there's a lot of signage, up, very inaccurate, unfortunately, that talks about 
uh, who's there and, and, and the history of the site. And she said, you know, I was, I was, we were doing a ceremony and uh, someone came up to her from Fox News or something and wanted to interview her. And she said, and they asked her you know, about what it meant. And she never, and she goes, it was right then when she was having this interview with this reporter, because they asked her about her relationship to this space, and that she realized these are my ancestors are buried here, and this is a cemetery. And it's not always taken care of in the same way that a cemetery would be. Um, and so she said, you know, since that time, she's really tried to take care of this space and really advocated for um, its return to uh, Dakota indigenous communities. Uh, there was even a whole issue around people wanted to build a splash pad and right near this site and without even consulting you know indigenous communities and crystal told us the story of kind of how she brought together community and had community meetings and posted things on facebook and and got people involved um to really you have to put that pressure on on the government and other entities to to really acknowledge what this space is, because she said you could never put a splash pad in a cemetery, right? Any other cemetery. So why is it okay for right here? Let's take the money that we're going to do to build the splash pad and let's educate the community. And so now there's signage that says this is a cemetery, and there's signage on the on the park benches to remind people to respect the space. Um, and it's even really shifted the way that we take care of the space, um, and instead of just showing up and doing our tending and taking, you know, we were removing invasive species or displaced plant relatives and things like that, but actually thinking about how do we partner with other native let space in a different way. Um, we can still care for the land and the space, but wanting to do it in a more efficient way. Um, we talked about trees earlier. This is another uh, place near Bedote at the confluence. And these are actually have scars from the ropes that were slung around the trunk. You can still see this if you go down there. Um, from the dock boats that removed indigenous people from their homeland. So when we talk about trees, do have memory. And I mean, even physically, you can see the memory of that. Uh, and I definitely encourage you to, to, to think about those things. And, and there's places that we don't know about, and there's histories that we don't know of. You know, even right here, in, I'm sure in your um, by your, near your church, and uh, sometimes it's hard because we've lost a lot of Dakota elders. Um, I know during the pandemic as well to know about all the histories, um, but there's. And the other thing that's really important that we always try to remember and uplift is that Dakota people are still here. We're still here, right? They're still here, and um, they're you know, still a thriving culture. A lot of times we talk about indigenous people in the past and or uh, invisibility is a huge issue for indigenous communities and that makes it harder to advocate for their sovereignty and, and other um, other issues. And so just celebrating, you know, the enduring strength of indigenous communities. Uh, so I talked a little bit about our process at Friends of the Mississippi River, and really at the center, it really is about building relationships and solidarity with indigenous communities. Um, and that is not something that just happens overnight, and it takes a lot of time. And so, you know, we have our indigenous solidarity committee that's kind of in turn and kind of checking in and holding ourselves accountable. Um, and then outside of that, we, our education team, that's my team, we do education and stewardship events. Um, we've been really thinking in this last few years, how do we really center Dakota voices and think about indigenous knowledge and science um, so that we're really integrating that into our curriculum. Um, we do a land acknowledgement at all of our events. Um, we've integrated it into our courses and um, really trying to combat invisibility and harmful narratives and add, you know, really uplifting all these indigenous ways of thinking and being and knowing um, so that we're not pr privileging a Western science over indigenous sciences um, when we're introducing lessons. And it's gonna be an ongoing process and it's not something that we're gonna be able to just check off and say we're done. <laughs> so we're really just starting to uh, ensure that we're um, 
be more inclusive. And then there's just a lot through this whole process. There's lots of learning and unlearning, <laughs> a timer for reflection, um, and then thinking about action and add. Um, sometimes it's something really simple. For example, I to kind of show you an example of something. Um, we've been working with the Lower Feeling Creek project that I mentioned before. Organization is involved. And we developed a management plan with them uh, two years ago about uh, they were working on their site and they wanted they needed some support with that. And we really uh, worked with them to do community surveys about what are the native plants that are important to um, indigenous communities that you would want to your management plan of this site. So that we're planting plants that are culturally significant and also um, good for our land and for the water. Um, so they did surveys and we helped them write the management plan. Um, and also in that uh, building kind of on that process, um, we started to develop these relationships with uh, the community members and with the staff. And so then when it came time to develop our curriculum, you know, I, I went back to that organization and we had already had lots of conversations. And it was a lot easier than to, for them to trust us um, with community contact. And they're the ones who introduced me to Crystal. And I talked with one of their staff members about you know, her experiences. She's their environmental justice um, coordinator. And so it's really, you can kind of, it just takes time. Um, but kind of building on those experiences. And as a newer person to FMR, I could tell that they had they trusted us enough because I was brand new, and they said, "Sure, I'll help you find some people in the community to interview." And it wasn't, but it, again, that's after you know, two years of kind of building relationship with this organization. So, any questions? And the, yeah, and the learning and unlearning, we do a lot of internal, um, you know, reading articles and then having discussions about those articles or um, ha bringing in speakers to talk to our staff. So all of those things I think are really important. And then on our own, I do a lot of, I'm reading a lot of things on my own and uh, doing a lot of work on myself. So there's lots of things that we're doing, you know, now in different elements of our organization. Um, we do water quality education and uh, we've been thinking about, these are some of the groups that we work with. We just started a relationship with Native Youth Arts Collective because we have a youth program, um, and there's been some interesting kind of intersections starting to emerge there. Uh, Indigenous Roots is um, a BIPOC-led organization, sorry, Black Indigenous People of Color-led organization, and um, they work with a lot of different communities, um, not just Dakota uh, communities, but they are also located in St. Paul, and they connected us with this artist. Thomasina Top Bear, and she helped us design our water quality mural this year. Um, and this is over, you can actually see it um, in, uh, by, if you're familiar with Sweet Hollow Park in St. Paul, and I can send you a link to this as well. I think it is on my links page. But uh, she got community feedback uh, and then incorporated, you know, plants and messages that came from that community feedback. So. Sometimes art is a great way to kind of open up relationships and conversations. <laughs> and I've talked a lot about Lower Feeling Creek. That's our youth, the Native Youth Arts Collective is meeting with our youth group um, where we do summer and school year programming for young environmentalists. We are working at a farm in Minneapolis. Uh, as a non-Native organization, um, we are always trying to just be honest and like navigate our place, right, in this conversation. <laughs> um, we're building relationships, which I've talked a lot about, thinking about how we can be advocates, um, developing curriculum. Uh, and then something I haven't talked a lot as much about is integrating land representatives, landowners. We partner with a lot of different organizations who are. There are opportunities for us to speak. Chances for land reparations um, did that in the case of the Minneapolis Park Board. Minneapolis Park uh, Board is one of the largest landowners <laughs> in the Twin Cities. They own a lot of public land and uh, something that we wrote up there just to give them some feedback around, you know, how are they engaging with indigenous communities? Um, have they considered 
land back and, and what are some reparations that they could do. So those are things that we try to do when we can and just really actively seeking feedback all the time in different ways. Um, uh, this is just from a, the, the water workshop. That's, those are some community voices, um, including indigenous language is another way to just really uplift and honor um, Dakota homelands. So uh, this is something that Thomasina said. She said, during and after the community engagement meetings, I saw a few recurring themes, such as indigenous language, water and animal protection, um, which align with things often found in my artwork. I put mini Wakoni at the top to emphasize water is life, which is what that means, and to normalize Dakota language, the original language of this land. I also used the drawings of the Mississippi and added in animal relatives I found in the raindrops. So this was community. And again, I, I love doing arts program, doing art, because it's a nice way to open things up, equalizing, <laughs> even if you're not an artist. <laughs> so. This was Keely, who I mentioned earlier, uh, from Laura Phelan Creek Project. She's been really instrumental in helping us with our cultural landscapes curriculum um, and just uh, building on past relationships and then thinking about ways that we can can do more advocacy. There was recently an oil spill from a train uh, that happened in St. Paul, actually, <laughs> um, near Laura Failing Creek. And so when that happened, we reached out to Keely and said, you know, how can we support? Because she said no one's paying attention to this, right? They're a smaller organization. They post about their social media so that we can repost it. We've had meetings and we've uh, maybe we have to we have a pro bono lawyer that's helping us with a project. Maybe they can help you um, advocate for something that's happening with you. So I think it's about and support each other. Um, any questions before I do? Okay. Uh, this was what I spoke about earlier, uh, Indian Mounds Park. This is Crystal's daughter. <laughs> Dude, and this, um, this is from Indian Country Today. I also really try to be more intentional about the media that I'm consuming. Uh, there's some great um, native radio shows and podcasts and, and news outlets. Uh, and so sometimes it's good to kind of mix up where you're getting your content from. Because <laughs> we, we do tend to get stuck in a lens that's very, you know, Eurocentric and Western. And so, uh, yeah, but this is one of the things that they've been able to do. Um, is to change some of the language. And I think that, you know, Crystal's really pushing for them to get even further and to give the land back. So, so it's exciting to learn more about that. Uh, so we've talked a lot about going beyond land acknowledgement. Um, you know, we are acknowledging this, but we do have to acknowledge the theft and the genocide, but then celebrating, you know, our ongoing presence of indigenous communities, um, learning names, some resources that I shared, uh, about different place names you can learn about. Marlena Mike the full map that she's made of the Twin Cities so you can learn more about the that I know. So you learn or they also have a really nice memory map, the pronunciation of names. Um, so we're we're really working on the language. We've overhauling our website pages and, and kind of thinking about how do we incorporate more Dakota language. Um, you know, do we know whose land we're on? Uh, can we name any native tribes? You know, what, what can we learn about the land back? Um, and the other thing is that each event, just really thinking about when you're saying the land acknowledgement, that it's not just hollow, but that these are, every time I say that, that's an opportunity for me to learn more um, and to think about so some things for you all that you could think about is, you know, what is the role of the church, you know, and the surrounding communities, um, you know, and visibility I talked about, thinking about how do we counter some of the negative narratives and stereotypes. There's another good resource that I shared. Um, there was a whole research done around um, just kind of the, the myths and, and misinformation. Um, and they did a whole media study and it's, it's pretty powerful with, uh, to know what people have still, still believe 
that you think might be kind of acting stereotypes. Um, so it's important to counter that. Uh, this is a video I'm not going to show it right now because we don't have a ton of time, but it's a really good video. <laughs> uh, and these are two, uh, this is another video because I, I only have like 15 minutes left. Um, but this is Pastor Danny Gibbons, and then um, this is Jim Bear. And they both, he talks about, he's, there's actually the video is him at Bedote talking about Native histories, and then he talks kind of about African Americans, uh, their relationship to the Mississippi and to land and water. And it's a beautiful video. It's about seven minutes long, but it's, I highly recommend it. And they're down by the and it's just gorgeous. So I recommend that as well. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to make sure we had time to talk a little bit about what are some things, and we, we, we talked about a little bit now, but what are some ways that you've been navigating indigenous solidarity and expanding allyship or, you know, and are there some things that you're thinking about just even from our, what I've shared about actions you might take? I don't know if it's helpful. Do, maybe do you want to share with someone next to you and then you could share out? Yeah. Or do you want to, you have something to Sure. Here, what we you have. In line three. They might not be here. Yeah, that's a great idea. Go ahead. Why don't you share more? Do you want the the microphone? Why don't you take the microphone? Because I I feel like thank you. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> All right, impromptu. So, so no, no. This is so great. It's um, my I feel so lucky. So much joined the task force, the Valley Indigenous Land Acknowledgement Task Force, and asked if I would like to be involved, because I'm very involved with the Golden Valley Historical Society. So she thought I might have some information that way. And it's been so fantastic to reconnect with Valley. We've written this beautiful statement. It's been such a fun team opportunity. Mariah is on the team. It's led by Jen Biggs, and Richard also serves with us. Um, so we started writing this land acknowledgement, but we wanted to go further and I've done some grant writing for legacy amendment grants. And so we've um, put in a request for $10,000 to record oral histories with Dakota and Ojibwe people who are from Golden Valley, who have lived here or worked here. And we are so lucky. We found a professor from the University of Wisconsin who specializes in suburban indigenous history. She's like the only one in the United States. And so. <laughs> Right? <laughs> and she's so excited that on her own, she has applied for another grant of maybe $14,000 to expand the project. So we'll get these. The idea is um, not so much to center Valley in it, but to use our resources to amplify and lift up these other voices and expand what we know about the area. Um, so Mariah and Mom, did I, what did I miss? <laughs> Excellent. So we, um, we're very committed to a process of informed consent. You know, Native communities have often had people come in and do extractive work, thing, take things out without permission. So we're really doing a lot of work up front to educate um, the narrators about what will happen with their words. And the recordings and transcripts will go to the Hennepin History Museum to be preserved in perpetuity. Um, but the folks will also have an opportunity to say if they would like to give their recordings and transcripts to their tribal archives. Um, the church will have a copy if they're okay with that. And the Golden Valley Historical Society will also have a copy. So 
um, letting them choose what happens to their work, but also finding a way to preserve it in the long term. Um, my other favorite part about this project is that uh, through Golden Valley, you know, we have Bassett Creek connects Medicine Lake to the Mississippi River, and we recently learned the Dakota name is Haha Wakpadan. So the Mississippi River is Haha Wakpa, and Bassett Creek is like Little Haha Wakpa. So, <laughs> so we're we're basing the project around that. So thank you for letting me share, and I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Right, so we don't have the money yet, but if we did, the project would start in January and run through May, and at the end we'll have a big celebration, so everybody can come to Valley and celebrate the work together. Um, one is from the Legacy Amendment, so the people of Minnesota voted with their tax dollars to support the Legacy Amendment. The other is through a research opportunity at the University of Wisconsin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we would um, be more like a resource for the professor in Wisconsin, but this is the cool thing. She was doing another project and trying to hire some students to do native oral histories, and she found a young Ojibwe woman who grew up in Golden Valley and will maybe help her with that project. So we'll be there to answer questions and help them. Um, yeah, so maybe in the spring, depending on schedules, we'll try to get everybody together. Oh, I don't yeah, so so yeah, so there's a lot to come. Like things so we it's hard to announce that yet, but there's a lot going on. Yeah. Yes. Yes, and Mariah, you just jogged my memory. I should also give a shout out to Valley's Endowment Committee. They provided the seed money that got all this started. So, got to get all those partners put together. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, this is what I. This is exactly what needs to happen. Yeah, cheers to that. It's a process. It's a huge process, and it takes time, and <laughs> it takes a lot of time and a lot of people. Um, but it's like very clear that you have a commitment, um, and this is. Exciting. Yeah, I didn't even know the cool things that you're already doing. So <laughs> thank you for sharing. But that's why it's important to have these conversations. And what I have found is when someone shares something that they're doing, someone else finds a connection and then it builds and this this dominoes, right? <laughs> so but yeah, this is, I feel like you have some great uh, I'm gonna skip some of these things. Uh, so that because I know we only have a few minutes left. Um, but I did want to give us time just to kind of like close out. Um, and I don't know if we have time to really break into groups, so maybe we could just do this together. Um, you know, based on your experience and what's been shared today, what's one thing, like a new thing that you're thinking about or a question you have? All of us have a connection with the camp up north, um, Presbyterian Clearwater Forest. And so we have, about the same time that the effort started here, said we want to also follow a similar path. But one thing that I'm hearing this morning is, yes, it takes a lot of time and effort 
It also takes a lot of time and effort to run a camp. So we have not done anywhere near the amount of work you have. We have made one of the, the stumbling blocks in the beginning is who exactly is a good way and person to start to connect. We have made a, 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 a small connection up there, but we need to do more, and it, and it takes time. I mean, the commitment you guys have put in is impressive. And so I still feel it's in our future. Uh, definitely, you know, we want to do a land acknowledgement. We actually had a native person tell us that's great, but, you know, they were very pleased to hear we want to do more, just like, like you all. We wanted to work on some relationship building because we know people lived on our land up there, and we don't have that history in place. A long time ago, the Minnesota Historical Society did a survey to see if there were any things on our property that we should be aware of, and they at that time didn't find anything. But we still know, you know, people live there and, and things happen there and we're, we want to learn more. So we're in the early stages. There's hope we will do a whole lot more. Yeah, I mean, in terms of relationship building, I guess I would encourage people to go to, there's events, there's other programs, other people doing this work. Um, and, you know, just start showing up and you start to get to know people and build relationships and yeah, just keep showing up, and it just, it really does take time, though. There's not really one magic way to do it, um, and it has to be mutually beneficial. It has to feel not extractive, as you mentioned, um, so it, it is just going to be moving at the speed of trust, right? Yeah, I've learned that from, there's a book called Emergent Strategy uh, by Adrian Marie Brown, and that's what she talks about with community, working with community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. A new center. Yep. Yep. Yeah, there's so much learning and unlearning we have to do. We've all, because we even, like, we've all been colonized, right? Our minds have literally been colonized in a certain way of thinking about things, and it just takes a lot of unlearning um, because we've been told things that are just not true. Uh, I listened to a really difficult information, I mean, reading some of this information about our history is very painful. It's traumatizing. You know, Fort Snelling is, is something, as a kid, you think of, when I grew up, it was like, oh, this is a fun place to go visit. It's a concentration camp, you know? People were murdered there it, and pushed off their land. Genocide, uh, the amount of genocide that happened on American soil is, is very, it's, it's mind-boggling, and we have to confront that as a, as a nation, so... It's a lot of learning, like you said, and unlearning. So many, there's some great books and resources. Um, I maybe I, I know we have maybe two minutes left. I did. There's a beautiful poem <laughs> um, by Gwen Westerman that I think uh, to me is sometimes really helpful. Uh, for me, I'm an artist, I'm a storyteller, and a theater artist by trade. <laughs> so uh, besides being someone who cares about the environment, and so sometimes for me that's a great entry point is through art, um, and I think this poem really beautifully kind of sums up, uh, really sums up her, she kind of captures so much in, <laughs> in just a few words, um, so maybe we just want to close with the poem, if does that work for everybody, and um, maybe let's everybody, let's take a deep breath in first, and let it out, just a lot, take another deep breath in, let it out. Kind of ground ourselves in the time and place that we are right now. And again, I'm, I'm not a Dakota speaker, so I will do the best that I can. But you can listen to Gwen read this poem also on my website. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is Dewakpatanka Odawan, Song for the Mississippi River by Gwen Nell Westerman. Long before Louisiana woman Mississippi man 
before Old Man River, before Wade in the Water, long before Schoolcraft and Veris Capote, before Father Hennepin and St. Anthony, before Mississippi, long before Hernando de Soto, Otokoheya, in the beginning, the Makota Makoche. This was a Dakota place. The water was pure. The water was Wakan, sacred, mini. Peyuta Tokohe Heka. Water was, water is, our first medicine. The water was part of the land, and therefore, part of the people. And in this place, we flourished, from Bedote, where the Minnesota Wakpa joined the Wakpa Tanka. We followed the rivers, interconnected waterways, interconnected lifeways. Itokaya, southward to Hemini Khan, and Bede Isma, and Bede Istamani, the Lake of Tears. Waziata, northward the Big River, took us to Owamani, the whirlpool created by Hahawakpa, the curling waters of the falls. We knew the rivers rise and fall, channels and gorges, every meander, every floodplain. From Bidewakpan to Miniti, Mililak to the Lake of the Woods, Rainy Lake to Thunder Bay, where our burial, where our burial round mounds remain. Yopeta. Westward to Saskatchewan, the head of the Churchill River, and along the Baliante River, named Putsapi by the Cree, Dakota River, to Bedote, the beginning of the Mississippi of the North, and the Little Minnesota. These were our waterways and our lifeways, our medicine. And we too want to sing a song for the water, a song for Wakpatanka. So we listen, we listen, listen. And then at the edge of a dream, the songs come, condensed from the fog like dewdrops on cattails. They form perfectly clear, whispering through leaves, heavy voices rise up, drift beyond night toward the silent dawn and sing. Always on morning air, they come, connected by memories, connected by water. Well, thanks for having me today, and I'm happy to leave my card and follow up on any questions you might have, and just looking forward to continue to build relationships with you all. So, thank you.